was able to speak from this pulpit four years ago. I'm very honored to be invited back. I hope my thoughts aren't too confusing. I've talked uh, two times in a row now, and this is the third. And you always say, did I say that already? Or did, is that going to bore them to death? But pray that I can help open this wonderful scripture for you. It's one of those scriptures that uh, speaks for itself, stands on its own because it's so filled with magnificent metaphor and image, and yet it uh, needs to be endlessly unpackaged because it is so rich. So let me try. But let me try with a begin, to begin with the very last verse. It says, these thoughts have been recorded to help you believe that Jesus is the Christ. Let's start with that. For those of you at the Rector's Forum, this is, of course, what I just talked about, that, that most of us were conflated the two words Jesus and Christ. Most of us, frankly, were trained to think that Christ was Jesus' last name. All right. the, <laughs> this particular passage, as many of the sermons in Acts say it much better, Jesus revealed the Christ, Jesus became the Christ, Jesus proclaimed the Christ. So let's get that straight to begin with. In John's Gospel, which is mostly talking about the Christ, we're talking about a different archetype, image, teacher than Jesus, even though they become the same. And these, this early preaching is coming to that recognition. The Christ, and this is clear, so you don't think I'm preaching something untrue. This is clear in the prologue to John's Gospel, the hymn at the beginning of Colossians, the hymn at the beginning of Ephesians, the first paragraph of Hebrews, the first paragraph of 1 John. I have to cover all my bases. So you don't think <laughs> I'm making something up, all right? They all say with absolute clarity the Christ existed from all eternity. Mm -hmm. Jesus has only existed in time, 2,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. Now we who came along 2,000 years later, we just lumped the two together, mm -hmm. Jesus Christ. Uh, actually, it's one of the major, major Achilles heels in Christian theology because, to put it most concisely, most of us were taught or invited to fall in love with Jesus, but we weren't taught or invited to fall in love with the Christ. The Christ is a cosmic concept, and let me put it straightforwardly. The Christ is the Christian code word for reality, for everything. Jesus becomes the Christ, and in that includes in his journey that he walks for us and with us and in us, the classic archetypal human journey from, from conception, hidden conception in Bethlehem to an ordinary life of 30 years like most of our lives are, where you hardly hear about him, to trial, betrayal, death, and resurrection. But this is a statement. Now listen closely. This is not just a one-time anomaly and we Christians get all happy on Easter. Yay! God, the Father raised up Jesus. No, it's a statement about how reality works all the time, everywhere. And we're living in a most wonderful time where physics and, and uh, astrophysics especially is proving this for us. Quite simply put, nothing dies. Everything is transformed and the final chapter of history is resurrection. Now, this was always understood by the great Christian mystics, who were much more Trinitarian than most of us are. But we, we pulled Jesus out of the Trinity, tried to understand him as a standalone figure, whittled Jesus down, and unfortunately, that's why, to be perfectly blunt, we still have Christians who can be racists. We still have Christians who don't love the big mystery. They don't love the big truth. They don't love what Jesus calls the reign of God, we made Christianity into a tribal religion when it was meant to be a universal cosmic statement about how reality works. Right? Jesus is, to use maybe later language, is the, the archetype, the corporate personality, the stand-in for everything. Huh? Suddenly, it, the Christian message has huge relevance for the life but even more relevance for history. The other great flaw, it seems to me, that we've fallen into 
is to pull the gospel into an individual theory of how you can go to heaven and you can go to heaven and you can go to heaven or hell or you can go to heaven or hell. What a sad story. And then, and then it all, and most people go to hell by our own rules, it seems. <laughs> And, and you listen, you know, ever since the late great planet Earth and all this malarkey about Armageddon and, and Apocalypse Now, the final end of history was not resurrection. Quite the contrary. It was all sliding down to a tragic, tumultuous, and punitive ending. You see, when all of history isn't hopeful, when society isn't hopeful, and any of you who are therapists know this, it's very hard to heal individuals. It's very hard to make you hopeful, you hopeful, you hopeful when the whole thing is going to hell in the handbasket. Do you see? <laughs> Christianity was meant to be a cosmic message of hope for history. Now, with that, let's, let's go back to the gospel text, and we're going to see what this final chapter of history looks like. What kind of God we really have? And of course, if we're created in the image of God, how we image God is rather important. If he's punitive, we can be punitive. If he's violent, we can be violent. But what we're going to have here appearing behind locked doors, by where they are hiding for fear of the Jews, here we have an image of all of history hiding, almost always out of fear. Look at our contemporary politics in this country most of it fear-based, because huh? that's what appeals to the ego at it, the lowest level of motivation. In the evening of the first day of the week, the beginnings of a new creation, the first day of the week, the doors were locked. They were hiding for fear of the temple authorities. And Jesus came and stood among them, and he said, Shalom, the great Sabbath, the great peace of the Sabbath. And then he showed them the price of this transformative journey. He showed them the wounds in his hands and in his side. So we have Jesus, and let me just give two succinct words to how God, Jesus, is being presented to us. He is coming in the midst of history as the forgiving victim. Let me repeat it. The forgiving victim. Without it, we all play games of victimhood for our own aggrandizement, and there will be no, no new history. There will be no new day. And, and you see this in our world right now, people simply uh, accumulating past grievances to give themselves moral high ground and the right to be violent because you did this to us. And here Jesus, who is betrayed by his own inner circle, abandoned by most of them except the three women, at the foot of the cross, and, and John, I said to the last group, if I had reappeared, I would have said, you idiots. <laughs> <laughs> How can you be so obtuse, you know? And all he says is, shalom. Doesn't even mention it. Doesn't even bring it up. Hmm? This is a new day. This is a new history, which unfortunately has not been the majority of Christian history either. And not only does this new presence, this new availability of God crossing through locked doors even, but he breathes on them. Now, any of you who are students of Scripture know what this is connoting. Where did this last happen? Right at the beginning of the Bible, in the second chapter of Genesis, where Yahweh takes the mud of the earth and he breathes into it. So we clearly have a connotation of the new Adam. If Adam was the archetype of the first human being, as Paul says in several places, Christ is the corporate personality for the second transformed human being. And here we have a marvelous symbolic metaphorical statement of what transformation looks like. Because breath and spirit, Holy Spirit, and forgiveness are all equivalent. They're all the same thing. God is as available as the breath right in front of your mouth. God is always recreating humanity by this infusion of spirit, this infusion of love into the cold heart of Adam. 
And then to take it even further, and we call this the principle of incarnation. He knows that we're to, going to do exactly what we did, largely spiritualize this whole message. And he has to bring it down to earth. He has to bring it to embodiment. He has to bring it to physicality. He has to bring it to this world and the suffering that most of us go through in this world. And he, Thomas doesn't want to believe in a wounded God. He doesn't want to believe in a God who participates and is in solidarity with human suffering. And he says, you can't know what I'm talking about, Thomas, until you put your fingers inside my wounds. You've got to feel what it feels like for the poor, for the rejected, for the abandoned. Now you can believe. This is incarnational Christianity. This is not some bypassing of the human journey. But we have Jesus returning to some form of physicality, not fleeing into the heavens, but re-entering this world in a new way. And brothers and sisters, that's exactly the Jesus, exactly the Jesus you have access to today. In fact, this moment. It's the same Christ. It's the same presence. It's the same forgiving victim. It's the same shalom, and it's the breath you're taking in right now. This is my flesh. This is my blood. They may have life and have it abundantly. I am the Good Shepherd.